Welcome to the Medical Device Made Easy podcast. Here is Munir Lazuzi from easymedicaldevice.com. And today we will talk about sterilization. So we are working on a lot of design projects and there is always a question that is coming, should we sterilize? What is the method of sterilization? And today we'll talk about that with Jen Scali from Twinzo. So she's senior consultant at Twinzo um, and she's from Ireland. So Jen, welcome to the Medical Device Made Easy podcast. Hi, Munir. Thank you very much for having me. Uh, looking forward to chatting with you today. Yeah, great. I, I'm I'm really sure that we'll learn a lot of things today, even me, because as I said, I'm getting a lot of questions from my customers about that. So uh, how can I explain to them this kind of thing about sterilization can be, a, I think, a, a great, a great topic. So, but before to start, maybe can you just make a small introduction of yourself? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, thank you. You did introduce me a little bit there. Um, I am a senior consultant with Trinzo. I'm based in the west coast of Ireland. And I suppose who are Trinzo? Well, uh, they are a consultancy firm. Uh, they provide regulatory and quality consultancy for both medical devices and pharmaceuticals. Um, in terms of before Trinzo, I would have worked with both manufacturers and a notified body. So I did get to experience both sides of the table. Um, and it was very insightful having that perspective. Um, in terms of sterilization, it has been, you know, the basis of a lot of my work to date. Uh, I've worked with both on-site sterilization uh, as well as working with contract sterilization facilities. Um, and this would have included, you know, right through from installation qualification, operational qualification and performance qualification. Um, some of the work did include, you know, cycle improvement initiatives, remediation, um, deviations, uh, validation support, uh, auditing of sterilization facilities. So, yeah, quite quite the cycle in terms of the sterilization um, piece, but always always a very interesting topic. Never yeah, a dull moment. <laughs> exactly. Great. So thank you. And uh, I'm sure, uh, um, as I've said, uh, that we learned a lot today about uh, this topic. So just for people, uh, we had already some consultants from Trinzo that on the podcast talking about training, about IVDR. So we had a lot of uh, discussion also. So I'm sure this will be also a great episode today. So um, um, Jen, the oh, first I think I want to ask you is because as I said, we are sometime arriving to some projects with a design a team and we are talking and at certain point arrives the question of the packaging, of the delivery of, of the product, et cetera. And the question is, um, should we choose a sterilization process and which one to choose? And can we go without a sterilization process? So what are your ideas, if I can say, on this kind of, uh, this kind of thing here? Yeah, so I suppose it, it depends, you know, if you're a startup company that maybe doesn't have an established sterilization process, really, you're looking at all of the options that are available to you. Um, you know, that may be radiation, it may be ethylene oxide, it may be um, steam. There, there's lots of different ones. There are some that are more established and then there are some that are, are novel. Um, but really, you know, if you are, say, in that startup phase, you're looking at them all. And I guess the very first thing that you do need to consider is what are the characteristics of your device? Um, what options are available to you? So there's no point if it's heat sensitive, putting into it into a steam sterilization method. It's not going to make sense. Um, it might be more suited to radiation or ethylene oxide. Um, and if you say, yes, we're going to go with radiation or ethylene oxide, you then need to consider, you know, the, the additional pieces. What is your packaging going to look like? Is it going to be compatible with it? Um, also, what makes sense logistically? What are the options available to you um, in terms of geographic location? Um, what what offering does that contract sterilization facility have? So there's lots of nuances that do need to be considered at that very early stage. If you are a manufacturer and your R&D or your design team have come up with a new product, you may already have a method of sterilization qualified at your site. Uh, then you are looking to see perhaps does this product fit into a product family that you have? Is it also going to be suitable for that method? So if, for example, you've ethylene oxide qualified and you've created this new device, can that go into the cycle that you have? So it, it, it depends, really. Um, as you mentioned, the design characteristics often influence what method you may be able to use. Um, and, you know, sometimes R&D, marketing, new product development, they, they really want to have this really nice packaging. Uh, there's lots of layers to it. And then when it comes to that sterilization assessment, the sterilization person is going gray and, you know, shedding a few tears because it's, it's, it looks lovely. Uh, but in reality, getting that product sterilized might be a challenge. So 
it's really, really important to engage that sterilization person, be it somebody that you have internally or a consultant, whatever it may be. It's so, so important to engage with them at a very, very early stage because you don't want to end up in a situation where you have this beautiful design and beautiful packaging. And then, you know, it has to be rejigged to, to fit within the sterilization options that are available to you. Um, so, yeah, yeah. And what is what is interesting here is uh, is the fact that we have, if I can say, uh, during the design to validate this, this process and verify that it's matching. So it should not be something that arrives at the end of the project. It should be something that arrives really at the beginning to already define what kind of methodology. As you said, economically also, if you go for ETO, I think you have to have a high volumes because uh, they will not run an ETO batch just for one box, if I can say. So you have really to have also that. Um, it also about risk of your device, if it will damage your device or, or everything. So um, when we say it should arrive early on the pro process, so are we talking about early, like even when we are um, doing the design inputs, if in, when we are talking about that, or early means when we start to have some prototypes, then we can uh, define these kind of things. Yeah, so the design input will will have a lot of information that will be very useful to that sterilization person. They can provide some consultation at that stage of, you know, what may or may not be an option for you. Um, once there are prototypes and you know the packaging and everything like that, then it's it's full steam ahead where you will, you know, start writing your validation protocol and uh, liaising with your contract sterilization if it is a contract sterilization if it's internal or on-site sterilization, then, you know, you will have that department there. Um, yes, you're not going to get to the very end and realize this doesn't work. Uh, there, there should be some feasibility studies run there. If, if there are concerns, um, you might do some functionality testing and, and, and different things to make sure that your product is not adversely affected by whatever method you are choosing. Um, and sometimes, you know, if the device is quite similar to what you're processing, you might think it's okay, these other devices work, they're functional, it's it's great. But some devices may have a coating, for example, um, and that coating could act very, very differently when it goes through that sterilization process. So it's so important to, you know, sample that and make sure that it is going to be suitable before you get too late into the process and, you know, you're executed a full validation and you're looking at this thinking, okay, we've wasted time, we've wasted money, when that could have perhaps been addressed much earlier in the process. So absolutely. And as you touched on, you know, the volumes that you're looking at. So ethylene oxide is very much um, suitable for bulk processing. Uh, there, there can be multiple pallets in, in a chamber. Um, 12, 18, 24 in some cases. So really the volumes that are that are being planned ahead should be considered as well. Um, if it's smaller volumes, then perhaps, you know, your radiation or small steam sterilization um, autoclaves may be more appropriate, but again, very much dependent on the materials that are going into the device. Yeah, and uh, we have also other cases of, of customers that say, um, it costs too much for us to do sterilization and we don't want to do that. Can we just deliver the products to uh, the customer and they do the sterilization by themselves? We give them the instruction to a steam sterilization or whatever, but they do it by themselves. So is there a kind of a, 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 a case where we say, no, you cannot do that or no, this is not possible or no, you have to do it by yourself or these kind of things? Yeah. So again, dare I say, it depends um, who who is the customer. So if the uh, healthcare setting is your customer and, you know, depending again on the method of sterilization, a hospital is not going to have access to the likes of in-house radiation. Um, and if you are going for CE mark of your device and it's intended to be sterile, you need to review that sterilization documentation to say, yes, this is this is sterile, it's safe, it goes to the market that way. Um, but if, for example, you're using contract sterilization, um, there is a situation where you might, uh, as the, the customer of that contract, uh, contract manufacturer, you might perform the sterilization data. Um, again, then it gets into the whole, you know, who is sharing what information, uh, who is maintaining responsibility for this device, the legal manufacturer role comes into play. Um, and so if it is a contract manufactured device, there is a situation where the customer can uh, sterilize the device themselves. 
but it is up to them to generate all of that data, the functionality data, the shelf life, all of that information that you are required to generate post sterilization. Um, so there are situations, of course, we have you know the reusable devices, endoscopes, etc., and they of course will be reprocessed and re-sterilized in the hospital setting. Um, but if it's your your general medical device, um, it depends on who's CE marking it. If it is you it needs to go to the market sterile. If you are using contract manufacture, then there is that opportunity there where the the, the customer will sterilize the device themselves. And uh, when you are going for a contract manufacturer or service provider for sterilization, so um, for example, as, as we said, so we have a company and we want to go for, for sterilization. We don't have that internally. We, have, we are using a service provider. Um, maybe you had to do that. So how are you selecting those service providers? How are you looking or auditing them or checking something and say, this is exactly what you have to check to verify that they are fine, that they are um, they, they are capable to do the job? Yeah. So once you've identified what method you're going with, um, you've likely identified which sterilization facility will provide that to you. Um they will probably be a critical supplier because the nature of the process. Yeah. And so, you know, you will have your criteria for maybe auditing them or whatever the assessment may be. Again, some sterilizers will share a lot of information with you via email, via a data pack. Other sterilizers will not. And so you will have to do that on-site audit to get that information. Um, and really, when you go, you want to inspect the facility. You know, is, it, is there a nice flow? Is there product segregation? Uh, what is the risk of a product mix-up? Because you don't want to receive products that's supposedly sterile and it's not sterile. So their their inward and outward flow might be important to you. Um, the infrastructure they have in place, you know, you want it to be a good and nice facility where you're not going to have damage or or different things like that to your product. Um, once you have that element sorted, then you know you're maybe in the back room looking at documentation, and here. If it is contract sterilization, you will be looking and reviewing the installation qualification um, information. You'll also look at the operational qualification information that's available. Um, as I mentioned, these might only be available to review at an on-site audit. And it's really important that you document that very well because you're going to be leveraging that. You're going to be talking about it in your annual review or your periodic review. Um, so having a good understanding of how they are running things is, is going to be important. The other thing is if they are using biological indicators, for example, you know, are they making those biological indicators up on site? What is the storage conditions like for that? Um, what, is, what is the storage condition like pre-sterilization and post-sterilization? Um, if it is in a fridge or a room, is it temperature controlled? Uh, you will look at records for the likes of calibration and preventative maintenance. And so you're very much treating it as if it was internally. If you have a process internally, what is the calibration frequency? If there is an issue, what what investigation happens? Are the PMs being run on time? So you want to really have confidence that this facility is, you know, doing things in a manner that is suitable for your quality system and very much, you know, the expected industry standard. Some facilities, uh, they will have an on-site laboratory, so they may be able to do your biological indicator testing or okay. if it's ethylene oxide, your residual testing. Um, so you might also look at the laboratory capabilities there. Um, what are the test methods? Are they in compliance with the associated standards? Um, the certifications as well, you know, does does uh, do they have you know thirteen forty five for a quality system? Have they got qualifications or certifications in place for the various test methods? So it, it's really comprehensive, and you're very much trusting these these people and these service providers with a very critical process. So it's it's very important to to really audit them and understand what you're auditing. So um, I, I, I I'm 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 now maybe putting myself on the head of the people that are listening today, and uh, maybe they are saying. We have to do all that <laughs> because mainly it's all right. I th my, my service provider is ISO 13485, so it's fine. It's okay. I, I suppose, no, it's not okay. It's not the f because they are providing you an ISO 13485 certificate that they are suitable for your products, for your company, for your requirements, for all those things. So uh, you still have to do this check, I suppose. 
Yes, because a lot of this will perform or will will um, support that periodic review or the annual review. So in that you are you know, considering the deviations that might happen, how equipment changes are handled, if there are, you know, any changes to your um, OQ. So you really need that full information pack available to you to conclude at the end of the year that your sterilization provider is 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 acceptable and is running how it should be. It's also important that the person that is auditing your sterilization provider understands this because there is, of course, that you know quality system piece and somebody could be very familiar with 1345 and go in and audit them to, to those general sections of that. Um, but if it's somebody that is not familiar with sterilization or biological indicators or dosimeters, whatever it may be, you know, it, it can be quite daunting for them to go in and challenge some of the processes that are in place. So having that competency within that audit process is, is important to make sure you're getting the best uh, service possible. And accreditation. So we talked about laboratory, for example, for 17025, those kind of things. Are there some numbers or document or elements that you can share to say if they are should be accredited for that 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 and maybe it's also a good sign that they are a good company for for your service yeah absolutely so the laboratory testing you do want to make sure that it is happening in accordance with the standards um you know there's various tests that in general support that um sterilization process so the likes of testing biological indicators the residual testing for ethylene oxide. And outside of the sterilization process, you may also be using this laboratory for the likes of your environmental monitoring. Yeah. Um, so they might be, you know, looking at your environmental plates, they might be performing bioburden testing of your product, um, sterility testing of the product also to support that sterilization process. So you want to make sure that the methods that are in use um, are, are aligned and in compliance with those standards. Yeah, exactly. I mean, this is uh, so. Is there some specific standards that are really critical? And without that, if I can say, you should run away and not look at those companies anymore. Yeah, yeah. So really, you want them to be performing the likes of your bio burden testing um, in accordance with the ISO one one seven three seven. That will cover, you know, your bio burden, your sterility testing. Uh, the likes of ethylene oxide residuals that's covered by ISO 10993 part seven. Um, so if they're not, you know, aligning the methods or saying that we're performing the testing in accordance with X standard, you know, there, there are some questions to be asked there. And um, really, you, you don't want the headache of, you know, a different method being used and then you're into justifications as to why it's appropriate and it may not be appropriate. And you, you don't want to find yourself in that situation. Um, the world of regulatory is is difficult enough without bringing on unnecessary um, different test methods and, and whatnot. Hey, just a second. Do you need a EU, Swiss or UK representative? Then choose Easy Medical Device. We can represent you and also become your importer. Contact us at eo at easymedicaldevice.com. Exactly. I mean, um, so now if I can say that we have selected the right provider, uh, that we are starting to say, okay, now I will deliver to you some, some products for sterilization. We receive back those products. We receive also a nice document saying that everything was sterile. Um, normally, I suppose the company should approve these kind of documents, look at it, check that it's all okay and sign it and say, I'm, I'm approving this, uh, the incoming of this, these products and then uh, able to be shipped uh, then for, for our customers. So is there a specific person, maybe qualification or maybe diploma that is needed for this person that is receiving these incoming goods and say, yes, I, I sign. I mean, as we said, this is really critical process. You have maybe some clear knowledge to know about stabilization, mm -hmm. maybe some numbers of, uh, of uh, units that are mentioned there. So is there a specific person to do that or anybody can really do that because you have already validated your stabilization provider? Yeah, so, you know, competency is 
the million dollar question and I think it's it's across the board and I know Katie and Rod from Trinzo um, did discuss training and competency and different things but of course you know the standard it doesn't say your competent person will have X years experience in this qualification so it is down to the manufacturer to determine competency which means it can vary from organisation to organisation um, in reality you know that batch paperwork that will come from every sterilization load or run, um, that, that should be set in that you're not going to see a lot of variation in it. It's going to be the same set of paperwork for that cycle or, or, or that uh, processing run over and over again. And there's different approaches taken. So some organizations, they will have a person trained and uh, they will check that batch paperwork on a daily basis or two times a week, whatever the, the, the frequency is for receiving it. Um, they may have a competency check in place. So perhaps this person has had to review three or 10 or whatever the number the organization identifies and it's co-signed by a competent person. There's that check there to say, okay, this person understands, they're able to detect deficiencies or deviations within the paperwork um, and really challenging that and making sure it's documented because this can all happen and then it comes around to the audit and it's, well, how is this person competent? And you say, oh, they're trained to the procedure you know, read and understand doesn't necessarily mean that they will be able to detect, oh, there's a deviation here, this load needs to go on hold, and I need help with that disposition. So making sure it's documented is very important. And I suppose that is the daily or the routine processing. In terms of the validation reports, that is where you really need that, you know, that competency, that familiarity with validation, understanding tolerances and, um, you know, your process specifications. You, of course, need to understand them for the routine, but somebody can be trained to do that process. Um, when it is validation, you really are looking for that, you know, in-depth competency there. With routine, you can have a deviation. Um, and again, you need to have that competent person there to help you disposition it because it, it might need a rationale that it's okay to release. It might not be okay to release. And again, those decisions need to be documented. And, you know, the competency of that person making that decision is something that could be challenged. The last thing you want is for it to be accepted and released to market and for a sterility issue to arise. Um, unfortunately, there is no diploma out there. I know there is some work ongoing on that um, because it's the it's the repeat question in audits and everyday life for a sterilization person. How are you demonstrating competency? So there, there are, of course, courses out there that you can do. It could be a two day, five day course, depending. Some of them have, you know, an entry criteria. You have to have X years of experience to be able to do it. Um, and really, you know, it's important. Some people go in, they read a procedure. I, I can't emphasize the importance of actually reading the standard. Yep. Uh, having access to a copy of the standard, you have your procedure and it pulls out all the information that you need for a compliant process. The standard has lots more language. It has context. It has guidance at the end of it and, and, and different things like that. So um, when when I was auditing, you know, it's, it's quite surprising the number of people that haven't access to that standard or don't have a copy on their on their desk. So really, I would say to, to everybody, be it 1345, be it your sterilization standard, read the standard as well as your procedure. Um, so yeah, unfortunately, there isn't a, a course that you do when you're immediately determined uh, as a competent person. It, it comes with experience and training. No, but uh, I, what you said about the person not having the standard, I, I, I see that a lot of with many companies also that says, yes, yeah. we, are, we are releasing products for this standard or that standard. And I ask them, do you have a copy of it? And no, they don't. <laughs> Because, yeah. I mean, they maybe used it in a previous company, so they know what is inside, etc. But when they arrive to a new company, they think, oh, I know already about it. No need to no need to look at that. But yeah, better yeah. for also the company to have the standard, to show that during an audit, to show that they are really knowledgeable of that. And that people from their company can have access to it in case there are changes also. And, uh, and it's really, uh, really important here. Yeah, um, and through 1345, you know, they should have control of that external standard. Exactly. Listing, so it's likely they are in the organization and available to them, but, you know, sometimes they just forget it. They have their procedure and they think, I have enough. But yeah, you, you would always get other nuggets or context uh, when you do read the, the full standard. Exactly. And you have to do your regulatory update also. So if there is a challenge between one standard to another, you have to make a gap assessment also. So there are a lot of actions to do. So you have to 
maintain mm-hmm. the standards within your your quality management system and and make changes if they are they have changed also. Um, mm-hmm. Another question about this person that can, if I can say, do this this release or this this check. Um, if the company is maybe a small company, they cannot hire a full time person to do this thing, and we have one batch that is coming every three months or four months, so it's not like something that uh, is a routine. Uh, can they subcontract this action to a consultant or to anybody that is maybe coming or receiving those documents once in a while and and looking, approving, and signing, etc.? So. Is there a specific process for that or is it forbidden for them to do this kind of thing? No, no, you can. You can use a consultant or a contractor to do this for you. Um, they will be treated, you know, the same. They're, they're almost a supplier to you in terms of a service. They're there to, to do that. Um, the one thing that I would say is very important is to make sure they're trained to your procedures and your forms yeah. and whatever the process is for the release or the validation of that. Um and, you know, you might bring them on board in January and you have a batch in January, they really said, that's great. You might have another batch in May. You may have updated your form or your procedure. So if there is that time frame between these con- the, the consultant's visits, make sure there is a check in place that will capture any updates to procedures or forms. Um, the, other, the other thing is you need to maintain these records for a defined period, depending on, on, on the device. And so if you know, five years down the line, this batch is being looked at, it's good to make sure that you have that consultant's qualifications on file. So you can say, yeah, "Yeah, they were competent. Um, Here's their training record. Here's their CV. Here's any associated qualifications they may have. So if you are, you know, outsourcing that to a consultant, again, just document the the process for doing that. Um, So yeah, it's not forbidden. Um, Obviously, there is situations where you have a startup or a small manufacturer and it's it's just not feasible to have that full-time person um, as a direct employee. So yeah, absolutely, that that can happen. Just document it and uh, make sure it's all above board. Yeah, as as you said, treat this person or this this company as a, a supplier. So should have be on your supplier list, approved supplier list with all the evaluation qualifications, etc. Verify that they are doing correctly and they are updated within your system and and everything. So uh, not sure if you have to audit them <laughs> specifically, but you have to, as you said, audit yeah. their qualification and receive this information and store them. Uh, but no need to go to audit them uh, or maybe no. in, maybe if they are in a nice place, maybe try to find. <laughs> an excuse for that but uh, uh yeah yes so if you are now okay we have done all this process we set up everything we have the supplier we have the qualification we have the people that are trained to do this exercise now suddenly you are audited by a notified body uh, they are coming to your place and they are checking that you have a procedure for sterilization you have validation you have all this and that etc so um do you know can we help maybe the audience today to identify the most common issues that we have, maybe even if you have maybe told some of them uh, on the episode, so most common issues that maybe a notified bodies will identify or the, we call them the low hanging fruits, things that every notified body knows that as soon as they will ask this question, they will get the bad answer and they will raise a non-conformance for that. So is there some kind of those elements that people can um, already correct now and say, okay, we'll save our time and, and not receive a non-conformance because... This is mainly a, an obvious issue that everybody is, is catching up. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I suppose in terms of that notified body involvement, it, it's a two part piece. Uh, so there is obviously the audit, you know, be it the audit of your quality system or the audit of your sterilization facility if it's in-house. But there's also that technical documentation review, which, you know, so many manufacturers are going through as we get into the MDR. So th- there's two parts to that. And I'll start with the, the the technical documentation review, because I know everybody is, you know, scratching their head at moments uh, during this process. And I would like to say that you know your product better than anyone, better than Notify Body, better than the manufacturer next door to you. So if you cannot make sense of the validation or the sequence of events as to how you are, where you are today, the chances are your Notify Body is not going to be able to follow it either. And I say this because you might have done your, your IQ or your OQ or you know establishing that relationship between your IPCD and EPCD back maybe 10, 15 years ago. And you might not have been the person that performed that validation. They could have, you know, moved on to another company, won the lotto and retired and are sitting on a beach. Whatever the situation may be, 
you as the manufacturer need to be able to piece that together. So you, you're looking at those original documents, you're looking at events that have happened since then. So maybe you have changed um, uh, some parameters in your cycle, maybe you changed your configuration, but you're still you know, leveraging some data from, from previous, depending on what the change is. So there, there will probably have been events that have happened in those 10, 15 years, um, that you will need to be able to tell the story about because if you can't the notified body is not going to be able to so um make sure you're able to explain that but when you do get into the technical documentation review again there's some differences depending on the method of sterilization so if we look at the likes of um radiation and the dose audits there is a quarterly requirement there to do them and if you look at quarterly from a calendar perspective you know january and june Technically, that's across two quarters, but that's six months between those dose audits, and and that's not acceptable. So, you you need to make sure that your dose audit frequency is happening on time. And I have I have come across it time and time again where it's just noted as quarterly, and it happens any time within that quarter, and that that's not acceptable. The other the other area within the technical documentation is if you haven't performed a requalification because. You know, in the world of ethylene oxide, you don't necessarily have to do that every year. You do your annual review and you determine if you need to do that in the coming year. Um, and the the detail that goes into that annual review really may not be that sufficient to come to a solid conclusion. Um, you would see from time to time where maybe an annual review wasn't performed or the conclusion of the annual review was that no, no requalification was required but maybe they, they didn't realize it's been over two years since last requalification. So little things like that. Um, the other piece uh, within that technical documentation is the representative product. So usually you have this you know, product that represents the product family. Yeah. There may have been changes to that and understanding what those changes, understanding the relationship of this master product to your other product sometimes isn't documented very well. And if it's not documented very well, as the notified body, you're looking at this thinking, I don't understand how this is representative. So, you know, making sure that that is very clear. Um, in terms of the audit, uh, if organizations are using maybe a contract sterilization facility, some of them are quite good. They send a reminder to say, hey, listen, your requalification is due um, or, you know, we have our own procedures for validation and different things. Sometimes manufacturers then don't create a procedure and that, that's not acceptable because as the manufacturer, they are responsible for the sterilization process. They are responsible for identifying, you know, what may trigger requalification, what may trigger validation, how to adopt a product, how to assess a change. So, you know, using the, the get out of jail of we use contract sterilization that doesn't mean that you don't have to have the procedures and everything within your quality management system. So I would have I would have come across it from time to time where, you know, they are using that uh, caveat of contract sterilization to not have that. The other area um, would be the review of the batch paperwork. You know, sometimes the, that review is very, very light and it's it's assigning, they're, they're taking the word of maybe the contract sterilization facility that everything passed. Um, so I, I have come across issues where, you know, a deviation or an issue wasn't detected maybe by the sterilization facility and they didn't perform internal checks on that batch paperwork, which, you know, ultimately resulted in a deviation slipping through. So again, just making sure that that batch review is comprehensive, it will pick up because look, some of these things are are human error and yeah. it, it's just the nature of it. it it's, it's a review. If you're looking at review after review after review, these things can happen. But of course, we want to put in as many, um, you know, pieces in there to prevent any of that getting through. So yeah, exactly. just making sure that procedures and annual reviews is, no, I think I, I think you're right, and uh, sometimes when there is some routine on on this process, the thing is that people are not seeing anymore the issue. So as I said, they have this stamp, they put the stamp, they put the signature, they put acceptable, they put thing, and then they they, they pass and they pass yeah. and they pass. So sometimes it's just human error, and if it happens on Friday afternoon uh, at the end of a, a full week, etc., it can maybe be a mistake. But yeah, um, I suppose having also the two the four eyes principle will be a great process to review, like somebody that is signing and somebody that is reviewing 
knowing that everything is fine or, or this kind of, of principle is also a great thing. And the other thing is to, to make sure that the person understands the criticality of the review, you know, really understanding what this means. If you're reviewing sterile batch paperwork, you know, you're saying your load and your product is sterile and what that means for when it goes to the market. Because, you know, if you're training somebody into this role, it can be just another review, another yep. part of the process. So really, you know, sharing that information, creating that awareness around the criticality of this process and the consequences of what happens if product goes out there and isn't sterile. It's really not a nice thing to, to think about. Um, and, and so making sure that there is awareness around that is, is really important within an organization. Great. So, yeah, I think, I think, um, I mean, all, all what you mentioned makes sense, and I hope this will help uh, the, those companies to uh, take point by point and try to see if there are any issues or any gaps on on their system. But yeah, um, I suppose yeah, notified bodies are really also uh, understanding this criticality, so it's why they will be making a, 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 a deep dive review of this, and, and if they find anything, it can be really a, a major issue because it's touching the product, and it's products that are also on the field, so then... It can be also a big problem, uh, maybe a recall, a vigilance reporting or whatever. So uh, it's something that is really critical. Um, in terms of activities, so Twinzo, so as you said, you are a consulting firm. So for example, on this, if can you do a consulting uh, on this to help uh, companies that need maybe some sterilization person within a team to just review the batches and approve them or uh, helping them also to make the validation? So what exactly can you do there? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, Trinzo do offer sterilization courses. Um, I know there is some in the calendar at the moment for irradiation and ethylene oxide. Um, they're public courses, so anybody can enroll. But on top of that, you know, if there if there is a need for a sterilization course, Trinzo can work with the organization to understand their needs, um, really tailor it to what they what they want. Um, I suppose today we really only have scratched the surface with sterilization. It's yeah. so bad. There are so many, you know, nuances depending on the method of sterilization and, you know, really figuring out which which processes or which method is suitable for your product, how to maintain that, how to validate it. Um, so I, I do want to just caveat it with we did only scratch the surface today on it. But if there is a situation where you don't necessarily have that competency in-house, you know, Trinzo can work with you and help you figure out what modality is best for you, um, you know, helping you select that sterilization provider. Yeah. Um, yeah. As well as that, if you need support with the routine release or validations or anything like that, you know, Trinzo is available to partner with you and uh, provide that service. Um, so really it can be tailored. Uh, there is a really good panel of consultants and trainers um, with them and yeah more than happy to to help on that front great so uh, great so uh, anyway i will put uh, all the details for uh, contacting twinzo and uh, also your linkedin profile directly on the show notes so that people can can directly go there and, and download everything so uh really thank you jen it was really uh, interesting and really um providing a lot of information as you've said it's just an introduction so if you want to know more if i can say you can contact us and contact also uh, twinzo and just uh, get uh, more information about uh, how to to put that in place um okay so jen thank you very much um i um, I um, I really thank you for all the information and um, yeah I ask people if I can say to go on the show notes and then uh, contact uh, us if you need any information for people that are uh, listening today you can also contact me at info at easymedicaldevice.com info I-N-F-O at easymedicaldevice.com and then also provide maybe some likes or subscription to this uh, podcast or to this uh, to the video that is on the YouTube channel. We have made a lot of videos with a lot of other topics, so don't hesitate to go and search for maybe a topic that is really interesting uh, for you. So, Jen, really thank you, and I wish you a nice day. Thank you, Manir. It was great to chat with you. Yeah, have a nice bye. day. Bye-bye.